Um, so yeah, we're waiting just one more minute and then we will get started. Um, thank you again, everyone for showing up. Um, we really appreciate you and we're, I'm very glad we can serve you. There's so many people who work behind the scenes to make these lectures possible. Um, there's our founding editor, Caitlin, Caitlin Chans. There's the many contributors, um, two authors publish and our many instructors. I'm just the, the face of the lecture series in terms of the consistent hosting, but there's so much that happens beyond me that makes this possible. Um, so thank you everybody for being here. Okay, so let's get started. Hello, writers. Welcome. This is Jacob Jans with the Writers Workshop at Authors Publish. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Emily Collin, who will be giving a lecture on writing opening pages that keep readers glued to the page and also can make publishers excited by your book. So this is part of our monthly lecture series where we present talks on the craft of writing and the business of publishing. Emily Collin is the New York Times bestselling author of The Memory Thief. She's also the author of The Dream Keeper's Daughter published by Ballantine Books, Sword of the Seven Sins, the first book in her Seven Sins series, um, has won the YA fiction uh, uh, indie project author award from North Carolina. Um, and she's also among her many other um, things that she does, Emily is an instructor for the writer's workshop at Authors Publish um, where her courses are quite popular and have always sold out. Um, she teaches young adult novel writing, women's fiction and romance for us. Um, she's also a really skilled and talented editor for those of you who need an editor for your books, that's something you should keep in mind. Um, so without further ado, I would like to say thank you, Emily, for being here and welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, can you all see my screen right now? Is the share oh. screen working? It was working, but I disabled it, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, we're gonna make that work again. Um, can you re-enable it for me? Yeah, it should be re-enabled and you should be able to share it. All right, let me go back and do that again. Share it's with us. Good. All right, are we good? Looks great. Wonderful. Um, well, Jacob, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you so much to um, all of you for being here. Um, as uh, you all kind of came in and introduced yourselves, I had the opportunity and the privilege just to see so many different places from all over the world um, that people are hailing from to come and be here. So it, it is truly my privilege and um, I'm really excited to be with you today. So without further ado, let us jump right in. Um, so as you can see, as you know, you're all here um, to talk a little bit about how to hook readers and publishers with the opening pages of your work how to grab them, how to lure them in, right? And never let them go because the kiss of death is for someone to stop reading before they get to the end of your first sentence, first paragraph or first page. You could have the juiciest, the most wonderful prose, the most incredible action that starts 20 pages in, but if people don't make it past page one, they're never going to get there. So the question is, how do you make that happen? And that is what we're gonna talk about today. So, um, when people think about story, right? As an author, as a writer, we need to think about story on a couple of different levels. If you just come to a book as a reader, you are simply thinking about the words that you see on the page and the world that that creates for you. But, when you come to your book as an author, as a writer, you've got to think of it as a couple of different levels. There's what the readers actually see on the page, and then there is what you do behind the curtain 
to make that happen? Why choose the words that you have specifically chosen at that point in time? Why those words and not others? So when you write stellar first pages, of course you want to think about the craft involved in making that happen. Craft is key, but, and craft is what you see on page, but just as key is what readers do not see. Just as key is what's going on behind the scenes. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're gonna talk about actual what happens to make the words show up as they do, what words you choose and why. Okay, so here's a little quiz for y'all to do just in your minds. Um, there's really three big ways that people tend to start thinking about writing a book when they first come to an idea, right? There's three big picture ways. Some people do it in terms of the theme. The theme occurs to them first. For some people, the character is what occurs to them. And for others, it's the plot. So let's see where you all fall in here. So you might be a theme-based novelist if. So maybe when a story comes to you, what's most exciting to you is the reason you want to tell that story. The message you want readers to walk away from that story feeling or believing. There's some reason why this is so important to you and you wanna get it out there. That's why you wanna tell the story. If that's you, you might be drawn to your books because of theme. Then there's people who are really character-based novelists, right? Before they write a single word, they hear their characters maybe talking to them in their head. They envision a character, they see them, they see them interacting. And it's that that spurs them to write. And then you might be a plot-based novelist if the very first thing that comes to you is a big idea. And sometimes this looks like a what if question, like in the case of Harry Potter, what if a young orphan boy suddenly discovered that he was a wizard? That's a big what if question that spurs that first book. Uh, if you might be a plot-based novelist, what appeals to you most are the twists and the turns, the reversals that your story might take, what might happen. The other stuff might feel secondary to you. Um, and of course, this can change from book to book, for sure it can. Um, but in general, these are the three big approaches that people take uh, when they first get the glimmer um, of an idea in their mind to write a book. Okay, so I'm gonna make maybe what might be a bit of a controversial argument here. Um, so there's a wonderful author and an editor and book coach, you'll see me link to her here. Um, Susan, I'm not quite sure of the pronunciation of her last name. Let's go with DeFreitas and I apologize if that's wrong. She wrote a wonderful series of articles that was about what we just discussed. When you start your novel, what are the benefits and what are the drawbacks of starting your novel with plot, starting it with theme or starting it with character? And certainly for all of us as writers, there's a direction that we tend to go. At least I know I do. I, I'm a character-based author. Um, somebody in my writing group is a plot-based author. And when we critique each other's work, she always pushes me with plot, raise the stakes, raise the stakes, she says. And I always push her with character, like, great, all these twists and turns, but I don't really care because I don't care about these people as much as I should. So there's natural inclinations that we have. And some of that is tied into whether we tend to plot our novels out, we plan, whether we pants them flying by the seat of our pants or whether we're a mix, you know, um, some people story comes very naturally to them in terms of plot, that is a natural feel. So they don't have to think about them too much. Other people really do. But I contend, I believe that no matter what our natural inclinations are as writers, no matter where we tend to go naturally and we might always be strongest there, we can borrow from other approaches. And so I believe that before you write the first word of your novel, no matter whether you tend to bend towards theme, character, or plot first, you can think about each of them. You can begin with each of them, and then you can reap the benefits so that your opening pages will be as strong as they could possibly be. So let's start with theme. Let's think about this. So how do you know when you're thinking about theme? If you're thinking about theme, you're thinking about why am I writing this novel right now? 
Why does this novel matter? And why does it make a difference in the world or to me? You're thinking, why me? Why am I the right person who's telling the story? Why me right now? And then even more so you're thinking, when readers close the final page of this book, what is the message I want them to walk away with? And that can be thought of sometimes as the point of a novel. What's the point of my novel? By which I don't mean to apply that maybe our novels are pointless if we don't know that, no. What I mean is your novel's got a point. There's a point that you're trying to make. Um, it could be in the Outlander series by Diana Gabaldon. It could be true love transcends space and time. Uh, Harkening back to Harry Potter, it could be love will always triumph over hate, right? There's a point that is in your novel and that is the point of your novel. Every character is trying to prove or disprove that point in some way and every scene should touch on it. And so that includes your opening pages. We should see somewhere in your opening pages what that point is. It can be a subtle call out, it can be a thread, it can be a reference, but it is never too early in your opening pages to really be thinking about that point and how do we get it on the page. Okay, then they're starting with character, right? So who is telling the story and why? You know, do you hear your character speak to you? Okay, so from the very opening pages, what is your character's tone? How do they feel? How do they sound? What is their voice? You know, do they speak in clipped sentences? Are they funny? Are they bitter? Can you already, if you're a person who's starting with character, envision the backstory of those characters? Do you know why we should care about those characters? Not just what's gonna happen to them or where they were or what they were doing, but why they should tug on our heartstrings. Because if we don't care about your characters, it's the kiss of death in the opening pages. Do your characters remind you of someone you love or someone you detest? It's okay to have someone that we detest as long as there's something redeemable about them. So before I ever write a page in any of my books, I figured this out. Who is my main character? What does that character want? And why, what's their motivation for wanting this? It's gotta be important, right? This thing that they want is a goal that's gonna carry them throughout the entire novel. What obstacles are in their way? I need to know this because if they could just get what they wanted right away, there'd be no conflict and no story. What is your character's greatest flaw, the ghost that haunts them, that when this novel starts out, this essential wound is nagging at them and it won't be resolved until the end of the book? What happened to make them this way? And the opposite of that flaw, that wound, is where they should be at the end, what they need to learn and how they need to change. So before you ever open your book, before you ever write a word, I would argue that this might be the most important thing you need to figure out to make not only your opening pages, but your book as strong as possible. And then, you know, we have the issue of your novel's plot, right? And so these are all things that we're really thinking about here. Um, when you deal with plot, you're thinking about every great story can be reduced to what we consider to be a what if question, right? Um, what if, we talked about Harry Potter, um, a neglected orphan boy suddenly discovers he's a wizard. What if in Neil Gaiman's novel, American Gods, the old gods are walking among us and they're warring with the new gods of technology? Um, what if, let's look at Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give, a girl who witnessed the shooting of her best friend by a police officer has to choose between keeping the secret or risking everything to tell the truth. So when you start your novel with plot, you're a person who's drawn to those twists and turns. You're a person who is drawn to the concept of What's the big what if question in my novel? What is happening here to really drive the twists and turns, the reversals, the sense of forward motion? Answering that what if question is what drives you. You wanna find out the answers and the characters are the vehicle that makes that happen. Um, so this what if question is a good doorway into your plot. If you can summarize your plot with a what if question, you're on the right track. Okay, so 
having said that, let's get down to specifics. I'm a huge believer in beginning as you need to go on. And what I mean by that is that you need to start your novel at the very, very, very beginning with something that is as compelling as you possibly can. You need to grab your reader from that very first sentence. Don't wait until sentence two. Don't wait until sentence three. Um, that very first sentence, it should intrigue us. It should grab us. Think about walking through a physical bookstore and picking several books up off the shelf. You read the back cover copy. They all sound good. You look at the cover. They all look great. Okay, now you flip them open and maybe you've only got 15 minutes before you need to meet your friend. So there's not a lot of time to do what you need to do. You're gonna read those first lines. If they suck you in, you're gonna keep going. If they don't, you're gonna close that book um, and choose something else. So here are some examples of first lines I love. Um, this one's from The Gunslinger by Stephen King. The man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed right away. Who's that man in black? Why is he fleeing? The idea of a man in black is sort of evocative of something dark, we don't know what. The desert is a scary environment. It can be intimidating, it's extreme, it's visually evocative, and the gunslinger followed. The gunslinger, now we know the gunslinger's chasing him and he's fleeing. Gunslinger gives us this idea of the Old West. It's a strong first line. The color purple, you better not tell nobody but God. Okay, very strong voice right there. And then we're thinking, what's such a secret that the narrator can't say anything about it to anyone but God? What could that be? We want to know. Here's another one. I lost an arm on my last trip home. My left arm. So that's by Octavia Butler, an amazing sci-fi novelist. And it's so strong because we're thinking, okay, I lost an arm on my last trip home. Okay, that's so disturbing. It's very disturbing, but then my left arm. That almost seems like an irrelevant detail, but yet it sets the tone. Do they really need their left arm? They are obviously very matter of fact about this or not dwelling on it the way someone might be hysterical about leaving, losing an arm. What's going on here? And we have this example too from the Narnia series. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub and he almost deserved it. So there's humor there right away, right? That's not an easy name to bear. And you know the narrator's telling you right away that this kid is a problem, right? So those are some great first lines. Here's some more. Um, take a look at them. I won't read them all, um, but one of my favorites from the Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. There was a hand in the darkness, and it held a knife. That is one of my very favorites because right away you've got chills, right? Whose hand is it, and why? Why is it holding a knife? So you have our attention, now what? Okay, we gotta care about your characters from the start. We, are, we need to wonder what is going to happen to them. You need to start your novel in the very right place, the moment before things change, right? You need setup right there. You don't wanna start the novel too far back because then we're not gonna be interested in what's going to happen. We're bogged down in backstory. But don't drop us right into the middle of the novel because then we're gonna be confused and we're not gonna know what's going on. Use language from the very beginning that is as vivid, as dynamic as you can. Show us, don't tell us about it, but show us by immersing us in the story. And above everything else, make us feel, engage us. Okay, so the very first thing you have to do is make us invested in your characters right from the very beginning. Like I said before, we don't have to like them, we might detest them, but we've got to care about them. So how do you make that happen? There's a number of different ways. You can put your character in a really dangerous circumstance, put them in jeopardy when their life is on the line. Right away, we're gonna be rooting for them to get out of that circumstance. We can make them funny. Everybody loves to laugh. Think about that um, Eustace Clarence Scrub example from Narnia, right? Right away, we're kind of giggling. We wanna see, you like this voice. What does this author have to say? We, you can make your character do something we truly admire, we truly respect. Um, Blake Snyder recalled this saving the cat in his screenwriting Bible, save the cat. Um, that means that your character, even if they're unlikable or even if they are likable, they rescue somebody vulnerable or make your main character vulnerable, make them the underdog. So right away we are rooting for them. 
um, make them powerful, make them successful. We're drawn to that as, as readers. We want to be in the perspective of someone who is powerful. All of these things will make us care about your character right from the start. So don't just do one, see if you can combine more than one. And I have a link here that at your leisure, you can go back and peruse. Um, another thing to really think about, um, and I wanna say, I'm just gonna give you a little, before we go on to cliched beginnings, I wanna read you a little excerpt. This is from Kelly Armstrong's Waking the Witch. And I like to read it when I think about caring about character, right? So this is the very beginning. For the first time since Claire Kennedy died last week, there wasn't a police officer guarding the site of her murder. Okay, suspenseful, right? Kayla peered out from behind the boarded up beauty salon. Seeing no one, she hoisted her backpack and set out, kicking stones, her gaze fixed on the ground. She was careful to walk slowly. If you ran, grown-ups paid attention. Kayla hated when they paid attention. She liked being invisible. Until her mom was murdered last year, Kayla had always been invisible. But now it wasn't just the other kids who whispered behind her back calling her weird or, in grown-up language, an odd little thing. Adults did too. It wouldn't help if they found her sneaking into the place where her mom had been murdered. So, okay, right off, we feel for that character. We know her mother's been killed. They've got suspense. We know that she's the child of a murdered parent. We feel for her. We also know she's the underdog. She's different for more reasons than one. So right away, we care for that character. Um, on to these cliched beginnings to avoid. Um, I think it's a real tendency when you think about beginnings to think about beginnings of the day, right? So people start with somebody waking up or somebody walking into a place. Unless you're, the moment that your character wakes up is really crucial and specific to your story, don't start with that moment. Unless that moment is the moment that everything changes for your character. Uh, another cliche beginning to avoid is you start with something heart pumping, we're engaged, we're involved, we wanna know what happens next. And all of a sudden we realize it's all a dream. Not only are we disappointed, but now we've got to transition yet again back to that moment, that cliched moment when your character wakes up. So now we've got two cliches in one beginning. Uh, different genres have different cliches. Um, this is not to be con confused with tropes. The romance genre, for example, has many popular tropes that would be considered cliches um, in other forms of fiction, but every genre has its own um, cliches. So in um, YA fiction, for example, don't start your book with your character waking up thinking how ordinary they are, there's nothing special about them, and then boom. Um, in the first chapter, we find out there's nothing ordinary about them at all. They're as extraordinary as they can be. That's a cliche. Um, so how do you know when you're starting in the right place? Start your book in the middle of the action, um, by which I don't mean start your book with your inciting incident. The inciting incident is the moment when everything changes, the break before and after. Um, but start your book in the action. Um, trust the reader to figure out from context clues what's going on. As I said before, don't start too soon or we're going to slog through all this backstory until we get to the moment where everything begins, but don't start too late. Otherwise we won't have any idea what's happening and we'll be confused, right? You don't wanna distract us, you don't wanna bore us, but you don't wanna confuse us either. Um, people debate about prologues, but the general consensus I would say is to avoid them. Uh, experienced writers can use them to good effect. If you want to see a prologue done well, I would check out The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by B. Schwab. But other than that, unless you absolutely need a prologue, um, in the instance of The Invisible Life, she is conveying a striking dif difference between where the character was when she started and where she is now. And it's so dramatic that it drives the story. But often a prologue is used as an info dump. Um, authors think we need to give this information to the reader, otherwise they're not gonna understand what's happening. They will. Trust your reader, weave the information in slowly, avoid the prologue and start with the action of your story. And don't forget to involve sensory de details. Set the scene using all five senses so that we feel vividly immersed in your story. This is our introduction to the world that you have created for, our, for your characters to live in. 
So make us feel like we are there with them, make it count. Here's a couple of examples. Um, I open my eyes to the cold gray sky, to the howling ocean crashing against Jibita's rocky, rocky bluffs. Um, that's not actually the outset of her book, but you can feel it, right? You can feel what it must be like to have that oppressive cold gray sky, the noise of the ocean howling, the way the bluffs look. Those are vivid details that can immerse us in the world. And there's another example here um, by Maggie Steve Thotter. Um, feeling as if you have been awakened by a sound, in this case, a scream, even though the world is quiet. That's vivid, that will suck us in. Okay, from the beginning, we need to see voice, right? Um, what is that voice, that sort of elusive voice that people talk about? That is your character's personality shining from the page. Are they funny? Are they sarcastic? Are they really earnest about everything? They're so sincere. Are they rude? Are they nasty? How do they speak? Do they speak in such a way that they go on and on and ramble? Do they get right to the point? Um, how do they respond to difficult situations that they find themselves in? That voice from the outset, from the very first pages, should be so strong, so consistent, so that we cannot mistake your character for anybody else at all. Make that shine from the very first sentence. Okay, choosing point of view. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I will say that when you choose your point of view for your story, that is going to drastically influence the lens through which readers see it. So. Figure out, are you going to tell that story from the immediacy of first person? Are you going to write a fantasy novel that's got an omniscient point of view with a bird's eye narrator? Are you going to tell something from deep third person where you are just, you've got that little removed from first, but you're deeply, deeply involved in the body, the heart, the soul, the fibers of your character's being. Whatever you choose, intertwine it with your character's voice and showcase it to full effect from the beginning of your novel. And then this is another big one and it marches right along with character. Conflict, conflict, conflict. It's like location, 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 but different. If everything's great in your character's world and it looks like it's gonna stay that way, nothing's wrong, nothing's gonna change. It's just a day in the life. We really have no reason to keep going. Um, Gwen Hayes in her lovely book, um, Romancing the Beat, she calls it a slice of life with a hitch in it. And that goes for everything, not just romance. You want your character's um, slice of life going along. So that's the setup, we get to know them, we care about them, and then something happens to throw us off, right? Something happens to upset them. Are they doubting their choices? Are they in a difficult situation that's gonna require drastic action? Um, are they dealing with an unpleasant coworker? Are they on the edge of signing their business over to someone else, the business that's been their heart's blood? That conflict needs to be seeded from the very beginning. Something's not quite right. There's a question in the reader's mind. There's a concern in the reader's mind. We're already invested in your character. We care for them and now something's going wrong. We're gonna keep reading to find out what happens. There's three general types of conflict, right? There is self versus self when your character is at odds internally at war with themselves. Self versus other um, when your character is at odds with someone out in the world. Um, and self versus environment, which creates a very natural conflict. Um, normally, um, typically you'll see novels incorporating all of these uh, at various points in the story, but you've got to make sure that your conflict is there because that conflict, those stakes, is gonna marry with your character and the feelings that we have for them to provide narrative propulsion that drives your story onward. It's a train and we don't wanna get off. Okay, so stakes. Stakes is tied so closely to character and conflict. We talked about this before, knowing your character's goals, wants, and needs, right? So then the stakes are, what is your character, what do they want and what is gonna happen if they don't get it. And even more so, why does that matter, right? What's going on from the very beginning that's gonna compel us to keep going? So I wanna read another little example here to you. This is from Stephen King's It, this is the beginning. The terror, which would not end for another 28 years, 
if it ever did end, began, so far as I know or can tell, with a boat made from a sheet of newspaper floating down a gutter swollen with rain. The boat bobbed, listed, righted itself, dived bravely through treacherous whirlpools and continued on its way. It goes on and on and on, um, describing this. And then it says, there had been steady rain for a week now, and two days ago, the winds had come as well. Most sections of dairy had lost their power then, and it was not back on yet. A small boy in a yellow slicker and red galoshes ran cheerfully along beside the newspaper boat. Okay, that begins with the terror, right? Which wouldn't end for another 28 years. That's pretty dramatic. Then we know that it begins with the boat. And so that's what's circled back to at the end, right? The little boy that's running alongside the boat. This is an omniscient point of view. The narrator is telling us about the terror, showing us the boat and showing us the boy. Uh, the narrator um, in the form of Stephen King does a great job here of setting up the mood, um, the terror, the gutter swollen with rain, the bravely diving boat, the treacherous whirlpools, um, the houses that are dark, the rain. And then you got the little boy. Can't you just picture him, that small boy in the yellow um, raincoat and the red boots? We're predisposed to care about a little boy like this. We can picture the little boy in the boat and we know that the terror starts with the boat. So now we know something is gonna happen to that little boy. Who could put the book down then? I don't know. Um, I really encourage you, especially at the very beginning of your story, to write on a scene by scene level. By that, I mean, take a close look at what's going on with every scene and make sure that something in that scene is happening that drives the story forward or teaches you something new about the characters. That's got to be the case throughout your whole novel, but it's especially important at the very beginning. We got to trim all the fat from that beginning. We need to know that what's on the page is there because it's telling us what we need to know about your character and what's going to happen. If it doesn't do that, even if you love it, cut it. Every single sentence at the beginning of your story should suck us deeper into your character's world. It should teach us about who they are, what is going on with them, and why we should care, scene by scene. Okay, and then when you end a scene, every place throughout your book, but especially in the beginning, leave your characters with a question. Is your uh, main character going to steal that car? Can, they, can we trust what they're saying happened? Or maybe they really did commit the terrible crime that the detective's accusing them of. Or even a ticking clock. They need to get to the grocery store before closing time because they promised an abusive partner they'll have dinner on the table and they just realized they don't have the right kind of sauce for the steak. And if they don't get there in time, what's gonna happen? The partner's gonna be furious. You don't need a stereotypical cliffhanger, but any scene that doesn't leave the reader wanting more gives the reader no reason to keep going. And that goes double for your opening pages. Um, I wanna read you a little bit right here very quickly um, about curiosity. This is from Rainbow Rowell's novel and it's called Carry On. Okay. I walk to the bus station by myself. There's always a fuss over my paperwork when I leave. All summer long, we're not even allowed to walk to Tesco's without a chaperone and permission from the queen. Then in autumn, I just sign myself out of the children's home and go. He goes to a special school, one of the office ladies explains to the other when I leave. It's a school for dire offenders, she whispers. The other woman doesn't even look up. It's like this every September, even though I'm never in the same care home twice. The mage fetched me for school himself the first time when I was 11. But the next year he told me I could make it to Watford on my own. You've slain a dragon, Simon. Surely you can manage a long walk and a few buses. Okay, curiosity. Who is this kid? Why is he in a care home and why does he get to sign himself out? Why does he get shoved into different care homes, one after the other after the other? And what's he doing slaying a dragon? If he can do this, then why is he in this care home? What, 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 what's the tension there? Tremendous curiosity, right? Aim for that. Then we have pacing. So every genre is accepting of different types of pacing. Literary novels are more meandering, more slow. Um, genre mystery, for instance, demands a very fast paced plot. Know the pacing for your genre, and then once you know it, stick to it. Think of it as a literary scalpel, right? No matter how beautiful a turn of phrase is, if it doesn't push your plot, if it doesn't tell you something we really need to know about a character, cut it. It doesn't mean it's gone forever. 
You can make a cut file for phrases that you love and save them for future projects. But if, if it doesn't advance the story, especially in the opening pages, give it the X. And then figuring out your inciting incident, right? This is something that happens to your character, not something that they do. You're definitely gonna see it in the first 50 pages. Ideally, you see it in your first 30 pages. This is the before and the after, right? The inciting incident sets the main events of your story in motion. If you're writing romance, it's when your two main characters meet. Everything before the inciting incident is your setup, but that doesn't mean boring. That means give us the information we need to make us care about that inciting incident, make that inciting incident personal to your character, and then give us what we need to truly get invested in why that before and that after are going to be so key. And whatever it is, connect it closely to the theme or the point of what your novel is, right? There's a tie-in right there. Don't wait too long to get to your inciting incident or we're gonna be wandering along and set up waiting for stuff to happen. And then there's the idea of fulfilling the promise of the premise. That's a screenwriting term, meaning deliver on what you said this was going to be about. So think about how you can sum your book up in a single sentence or a log line, like a movie does. Um, and then make sure if your book is hinging on a certain point, if your book is about this heartbroken woman falls in love again, only to discover her lover is the son of her worst enemy, but nowhere in your first 30 to 50 pages do we have an inkling of this, your pacing is off. Something is not right. So I encourage everybody to, that I work with to write their back cover copy as if their book is for sale on a shelf. And then, you know, look at other books in your genre to see examples. Write your back cover copy. Make sure your first 50 pages hits all the high points because your back cover copy is a tease about what people can expect from your book. That's your premise. That's your stakes. That's your conflict. That's your characters and why do we care? We should see all of that in the first 50 pages of your book for sure. And this is, I think, a really important thing as well. Um, a lot of the time I see authors feeling as if they need to spell out every single detail when people say, well, describe, show us. Um, sometimes authors will show us by literally giving us every detail of what they think we need to see in a scene. But don't do that. Imagine yourself with a flashlight hiking with your readers in the woods. You want to shine that flashlight on what we as readers need to see to understand your story. If suddenly you took a flashlight and shone it into the trees and you were the guide, everyone following you would think that, hey, we need to look at the trees and then we might fall right off down into the abyss, right? So don't do that. Highlight crucial information about people, about places, about encounters, but don't give us every single detail. And what details you do give us, connect those very closely to what we need to learn and know about your character. What do I mean by that? Well, sometimes, again, writers wanting to paint a vivid scene, they just tell everything. At the beginning of a book, this is especially detrimental because readers don't know what to pay attention to. We only know to pay attention to those things that you show us. If you show us everything, we're not sure what's important. So we'll look over here, we'll look over there, we'll get bored. A bored reader is bad, a bored reader will walk away. So here's how not to open your book, right? Don't open with a mere description and a list of details. Here's my example. Tony was wearing a white dress and had long brown hair. She walked into the restaurant and sat down at the counter. Okay, you told us what she did, but we don't know Tony yet. So we have no reason to care about this. We're not connected to her. And so what? So a woman with long brown hair walked in and sat at a counter. That might set the scene, but we're not gonna find out what happens in that scene because we're not invested in Tony. So instead, what can you do? Well, think about discovering your, having, having the reader discover the scene the way your character would experience the world, not in sort of a lecture where we're just saying this happened, this happened, we saw this, she was wearing that. But how does your character naturally discover the world? Think about yourself when you walk into a room. So what do you notice? Um, let's say that you have asked your partner to wash the floor, but they didn't do that. So you're gonna walk in, you're gonna be like, oh my God, that floor is still dirty. I can't believe it's still dirty. It's the only thing I asked him to do. Why can't he do anything that I asked for him to do? 
Um, why is, you know, why is the goldfish not fed? Why is there orange juice all over the counter when I ask my kid to clean it up? Not only is that going to give us all of those details about that scene, but it's going to connect us deeply to your character's emotional state and it will move the plot forward because if your character is irritated about all of this, they're going to take an action related to that. So here's your takeaway. Your description and your details are key to setting a scene, but don't overload us with them. Choose them very, very carefully. Only give us those details about a character's appearance, about setting that will set the mood, set the tone, sneak in backstory a little bit in a way that helps us understand and give us crucial information that we need to know about a person or about a place. Now, sometimes with red herrings or mystery, you wanna seed a little doubt in there, but then you're deliberately misdirecting us. It's not so much information that it just overloads us. Okay, so I wanna talk a bit about backstory. And, you know, backstory is a tough one. People say, don't bog down your story with info dumps, keep us in the moment. But then they also say, well, wait, I don't get what's going on here. Why should I care? You know, so where's the balance there? I contend that it's a myth that backstory doesn't have a place in your novel. I think backstory is so important because without backstory, we have no way of understanding why the choices that your character makes matter. We don't care. It doesn't matter if they open up their own business unless we know that beforehand they were terrified to do such a thing. It doesn't matter if they finally jump off the diving board at camp if we know that they, unless we know they've always been scared of heights. But if you incorporate too much backstory, your novel will step on the brakes and then it has ground to a halt. What to do? All right. So what is backstory, first of all, and where does it fit, right? So there's several different types of backstory. There's context, um, where we get information from the context of your story. There's a specific memory where a character is reflecting on something. And then there's flashbacks, where we're full on out of the story, sucked back into a vivid memory. I would say this, if you take away nothing else, take away this, every book's got two stories, right? There's the front story, and that's what's happening on the page right now. There's the backstory, what brought your character to this point in time. In your opening pages, the front story is where your novel should live. There's a reason why you chose to start it there, not two months before, not six weeks before, not four years before, but right there, there's a reason, right? Um, so be very careful in terms of how you fold in your backstory because you do not want to start your story in a place and then suddenly two paragraphs later, we're stuck in a flashback two years ago. Um, include backstory only when it is absolutely crucial to what the reader needs to know, and then fold it in as part of dialogue, fold it in as part of action, fold it in as your character explains that information to somebody who really needs to know it in order to move the story forward. Don't waste your, your reader's attention going back in time with a lot of backstory when they can figure stuff out from context clues, right? So. Why does the reader need to know this now? Will it move the plot forward? Can I hint at it instead of explaining it directly? How can I connect it to the action that's already on the page or to interactions with other characters, right? Discovering these clues, as you see from this quote, you don't have to feed it all to the reader. We're always trying to figure out why our characters doing what they're doing. And so we put together our own backstory based on clues. Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're not. Figuring out is half the fun. Um, and so, you know, you want to surprise your readers. You as the author need to know all of the important information about your character's backstory, right? Their goals, their wants, their needs, why they are here and why it matters. But dole that out carefully and judiciously to your reader in the opening pages. Everything that you know does not have to wind up on the page. And then there's flashbacks, right? So. Um, many writers I found at the beginning of their novels, they really want to make sure readers understand what's going on. So they stick a flashback in very close to the beginning, which is pretty dangerous, right? Because you can derail the narrative momentum of your story before it even begins. So instead, fold information in as it feels natural instead of diverting the story's flow so early on. Your narrative momentum that carries your story forward. Something happens. Your character feels some kind of way, then something else happens because of that. Your character feels another way, and the story continues from there. Um, 
I'm not going to go through all of this, but I will say that Tiffany Martin uh, has a really wonderful way of explaining how flashbacks work. And that is, don't think of your flashback as something separate from your story that you're dropping in from above. Think of yourself as, you know, walking on a path through the forest. All of a sudden you see something over here that's interesting to you. You take that road, but you're still in the forest and it connects back around to the main path. So when you choose to incorporate a flashback, think about what's happening in the moment. Why does it remind your character of the flashback you're about to share? What's the trigger? Give us a memory of that trigger. Back us into the anchor memory, which is the flashback itself, and then build us gradually back out and into your main front story and help us understand how that flashback influences what's going to happen next. So it's a gradual train in and a gradual build out, not a drop. It has to feel relevant and drive the plot. So what does this all mean? What does it all add up to? It all adds up to the idea that your opening pages have to have strong narrative drive. Your character's flaws, their goals, their wants and needs, clear from the start. Empathy for characters, clear from the start. Conflicts between your characters and their world and your and, and internal conflict too, clear from the start. Make sure your stakes in your story are set out from the beginning and your inciting incident makes it on there in the first 30 to 50 pages. Make sure it's a compelling inciting incident. Make sure on a scene by scene basis that your scenes are consistently providing new information and driving the plot forward so your pacing is strong. And create curiosity, raise enough questions in your readers' minds that they wanna keep going to find out what happens next. End each scene and something that raises a question in our minds. Here are some resources that I really love. All of these I have found to be incredibly helpful. Um, so I encourage you, I know Jacob will uh, make this available to everyone. I encourage you to check these out. Um, they can be a wonderful means to really helping you take a look at how to build description, empathy for characters, um, story passion um, that you will evoke in your readers' hearts when they want to know what is going to happen next and why, why do they care? Because they care about your characters and other bits of information that I think are crucial to crafting um, first pages and even first 50 pages that will keep readers really turning the page desperate to know what happens next. Um, these are my books, um, both women's fiction and young adult fiction, as you can see. And um, that is the end. So that is a lot, I know, a lot of details, a lot of information to take in, but I'm so pleased um, to be able to share it with you. And I'm more than open to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. You gave us so many ideas for really crafting our books from the beginning and keeping readers glued to the page. Um, I'm really looking forward to sending out those slides, which alone I think will be quite valuable to people as a reference. Um, for those who are watching live, um, you are welcome to post your questions in the Q&A and I will ask Emily as many of them as I can, as we have time for. Um, but I thought, Emily, I would start with one question that I think a lot of people don't necessarily know they should ask, but I've noticed a lot of authors, they think they're writing in one genre, and that's true for them in terms of how they think about it, but the publishing industry has very strict rules about like what genre is in terms of what they're writing. Can you maybe give some people some advice in terms of understanding how the publishing industry thinks about genre? Absolutely, um, I would be happy to. So this is a tricky thing, right? Because what you see when you walk into a bookstore, I'm not even gonna say when you shop in the dreaded Amazon, but let's just let's use walking into a bookstore. What you see on the shelf and how books are categorized on the shelf in a bookstore is not necessarily how books are categorized in the publishing industry. I think a lot of the time readers know the books that they love and they write what they love, um, which is wonderful. But then when it goes, when you go to trying to make sure you can bring those books to market, then you need to really understand what genre that you're in. So um, 
for an example, um, we were talking about this in one of my classes actually recently. So I'll just give this as an example. Um, I have a student who's writing a fascinating um, dystopian novel with a very strong female character. And it's set in a near future setting. So she said, well, is this women's fiction? Because it's got a really, really strong female character. And I said, well, no, it's not. And it's dystopian fiction because it's set in a near future setting. Um, and she said, oh, OK, is that because of how it would be shelved? And I said, well, in part, but also because in the publishing world, you can weave magical realism into a, a, a women's fiction novel. But the moment you lift it out of our reality and put it in another reality, it's speculative fiction. So I would say that if you are interested in writing in a particular genre, but you're not sure whether you're actually writing in that genre, think about books that are comparable to your book, books that are like that book, and then go and see how those books are categorized. Google them and, and see how they would be classified. Some of it is by age, young adult, new adult, and adult is separate in that way. Middle grade is separate in that way. Um, but with an adult fiction, there are very specific call outs that agents and publishing houses will look at. So I would say do your best to familiarize yourself with that because you might not be writing what you think. Uh, thank you so much. I personally, I know a lot about the publishing industry and I still find myself confused by how genres are categorized. So any advice I feel is very appreciated and I think will be valuable for people who are pursuing a publishing contract. Um, we have a, a question from Red Haven Berry. Um, they ask, when it comes to beta readers or critique partners, at what point do you, the author, decide your first chapter is done being critiqued? How do you recognize over critiquing? Okay, well, um, my process tends to be that I sort of ration out my stuff going to beta readers um, because, you know, once someone begins to reread and reread and reread something, then the punch is gone, right? They can't quite tell if it's right because they try as they might, they can't have fresh eyes. They bring to it every reading from the time before, right? Um, so what I try to do um, is I'll give something to one beta reader and I will take their feedback and see what I want to incorporate and not. And then I'll send it to another beta reader. If I'm getting the same feedback from two or more beta readers, I know the problem is probably me. The problem is probably what I've written, right? And so that's hard to accept, especially if it's something that you really love. Um, I think that if you are consistently getting information or feedback saying, this doesn't work, this isn't working, then it probably isn't working and you should keep working on it. If you're getting little tweaks like, oh, well, one person says I didn't connect with her here and the other person says it bogs there, but they don't agree, then I think you're done and you can move on. Um, it's also really worth, I would say, asking your readers to take note of when they stop reading and seeing if they stop reading in the same place. Because if you have multiple betas stopping in the same place, even if they won't tell you they're bored there, it's a signal to you as the writer that that's where their attention drifts and you should probably focus. Uh, thank you, that's helpful. Um, we have another question just about how do you find a critique partner? Do you have any advice for finding beta readers? I do, I do. Um, so there's a number of different ways to find critique partners. Um, you know, there are definitely um, websites like um, Scribophile that will set you up with critique partners. There's likely critique partners in your geographic area that you could connect with through um, a local uh, writer's network or writing group. You can ask at your local independent bookstore if they know of writers in the area um, who might be interested in forming a group or meeting there. I know um, several people um, from my classes at Authors Publish that have gone on to help each other and work together because they see that they are writing something similar and they are in that same kind of ability level. You do wanna look for betas who are your ability level of writing or better so that you can lift each other up. I also have um, a lot of people who tell me that when they apply to Twitter pitch contests or mentoring programs, that even if they don't get accepted, they meet each other in the conversations, discover that they're writing similar things based on their pitches, and then develop relationships. There's someone in my critique group who met her critique partner that way, um, and through that has now found an agent, and that connection would never have existed if they had not first connected with this person through 
um, Twitter pitch. So, um, you know, I, I feel like there's so many different ways to go about this. I see someone has a suggestion of checking local libraries, also extremely valid. Um, but yeah, I think that finding your community, um, though sometimes challenging, is so important. And now, um, with the advent of um, virtual events and the inter internet being so prevalent, my critique partners live all over the world. And that wouldn't have been possible, you know, a few years ago. So don't limit yourself to your geographic area. I think it's uh, it, such an important question, actually. I've taken to reading the acknowledgments at the end of books, and you'll often see like a dozen or two dozen names listed. And so many of those are like beta readers and critique partners. And that's that's the norm is to have such a large community helping support one book. So I think it's it's just part of the process, right, of getting a book published and into the world is having those critique partners. I agree completely. Um, somebody asked if the slides will be available for download. And yes, we will be sending out the slides with the recording later this week. So you'll be able to refer back to them as much as you want. Um, this is, a, this is a, a good question, but a simple question. How long are the opening, how many pages are the opening pages? Like, what should you focus on? Is it the first 50 pages? Um, so there's kind of stages to this, right? Um, I'd say, I think of it in stages. Think of your first sentence, all right? Then think of your first paragraph. If you lose readers at that point, you're really in big trouble, right? Okay, you kept your readers for your first sentence, you kept them for your first paragraph, then you wanna get them to the bottom of the page and turn the page, okay? So you did that. Um, at that point, you're wanting to get them through the first 10 pages. Oh, that first 10 pages, a pretty standard amount that you hear agents asking for, other people asking for to critique. Um, so first 10 pages is the beginning, right, of your opening pages. It can then stretch, the outer limit of it is 50 pages. So. I would say first, you know, first sentence, paragraph, and page, first 10, first 50. Um, I think it's interesting from my perspective as a reader, um, there's the point where I'm willing to be a little bored that if you can get me to that point into the book, like say 50 pages, and you can make a few mistakes, that's past the opening pages. I don't know if that makes sense, but like if I'm there, if I read enough of a book, eventually I'll be committed enough to it to forgive um, the flaws that are in most books, but I'm still thoroughly entertained eventually. Well, um, and I think that's, you know, kind of the point I was trying to make is by that point, you are so invested in your characters and you're so invested in the story that you'll keep going. We can, I mean, it's not great, but we can forgive a little mistake in pacing here or a little bit of, eh, I mean, we don't want that, but we'll forgive it in a way that we won't forgive in the opening pages as a reader. That makes sense. Um, we have a question about um, the bulletin board behind you. Um, sure. Would you like to talk about that? Oh yeah, um, so that bulletin board is um, on temporary hiatus at the moment, but that's my plotting bulletin board. Um, and uh, sometimes when I, I tend to be a pretty visual person. So sometimes when I um, plot out a story, um, those are uh, cards from Save the Cat Writes a Novel, um, which is just a plotting system that I sometimes use. Sometimes I will do it physically where I like to move index cards around and see where things work out. Sometimes I will um, you know, have images of my characters that I stick up there. Sometimes I'll take whatever's there and put it into like um, a spreadsheet where I'll move it around. But uh, because I'm very visual, it's helpful to me to sometimes literally, except especially if I get stuck, like I've got something I'm writing right now that's got a front story and then a sort of a historical backstory that needs to be really seen visually and moved around. I'll put stuff up there so I can take a look at how it's working. It's very cool. Um, we have a question from David about um, short stories. Um, how would Emily say short stories are different in terms of opening pages and the other points you've been discussing? For sure. Okay, so I'll preface this by saying I'm not a short story expert, um, but I'll tell you my perspective as a reader, because um, I, I don't write a lot of short stories, though I've written some. I think short story is like everything I just said, but goes double, triple, and quadruple, right? Short stories, you have so much less time to make the reader care. I mean, you can boil that all the way down to flash fiction, right? You've got so much less time to make the reader care about your character, to develop your plot, to establish the stakes, to use vivid language. You can't draw anything out 
So I would say that everything I said about this does definitely apply to short stories, but that short stories are kind of like the concentrate and those are like the diluted version. I think it all definitely applies. I, I think I think you're right. It seems to me that a really good short story is just opening pages. They just keep you engaged throughout the entire story and then it's over. Absolutely. Um, We've had a few people ask about whether these ideas apply to nonfiction and memoir. Do you have thoughts on that? I do. Um, again, I'm not a memoirist, but I will say this. Um, so as memoir, as compared to biography, memoir is very, very different than biography, right? Biography is in some ways, in a narrative version, a straight up interpretation of the facts, right? Memoir is a story and memoir much like, um, I think one thing that really truly applies uh, to memoir is the idea of theme. In fact, maybe more than anything else, the idea of theme, right? Because you could tell so many different stories about a person's life, but in memoir from the very start, you need to identify what's the theme and what's the lens that we're going to view this person's life through and everything hangs on that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in memoir, you also have to care about the characters. You have to be deeply invested. You have to, you have to make it just as in fiction that each character has a unique voice. You have to make it just as in fiction that we see why you chose to tell the story at this point. What, so what's the inciting incident in your memoir? Like if nothing happens to change your life, then you'd have no story to tell. If there's no conflict in your memoir, then we don't care about the characters. So. I think a lot of this is absolutely applicable because good writing is good writing. And if you are, memoir is to some extent creative nonfiction. And so all of these things that you're applying to your fiction can be applied to the structure of your creative nonfiction and your memoir as well. Yeah, I, I agree completely with that. It seems to me that it all applies, but you have the added challenge of conforming to the more specific requirements of nonfiction in terms of staying true to reality. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I think that's about all we have time for today. I'm sorry that we could not answer all of the questions everybody had. We had so many attendees here and we just don't have time to answer all of the questions. Emily, I wanna thank you so much for the presentation today and for sharing your expertise with our community. Um, do you have any um, final piece of advice or wisdom for the audience? Oh, absolutely. I would just say, you know, don't let anybody persuade you that the story that's in your heart isn't the story that you should tell. Um, stick with what drives you and what your passion is. It's never too late to get published. It's never too late to get your books out into the world. And there are multiple ways now for your books to find a home. So I would say if this is something that you are passionate about, which you obviously are because you took the time to come to this lecture, so thank you so much, then keep learning, stay open-minded, be open to feedback and devoted to your, your craft. And above all, have fun because this writing exercise is not something you have to do. It's something that you want to do. And so it should engage you and involve you and um, speak to your heart. So I guess that's all I have to say other than thank you so much for, um, for joining me today and spending um, an hour with me. It really means a lot that you would do that because I know we're all busy. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you everybody for being here today. I encourage you to visit Emily's website, emilycollin.com. Um, if you have questions for me or for Authors Publish in general, you can email support at authorspublish.com. Um, I wanna thank you for being here. And I also wanna thank everybody who works behind the scenes to make these lectures possible. Um, we have a wonderful team and community who makes my job as hosting these lectures possible. So thank you everybody. And thank you again, Emily, and I hope everybody has a wonderful day.